Well, I'm very, very pleased to welcome Graham Phillips back to Dreamland. He was last with us on March, the, in, in March, last March, March of 2004, for an extraordinary book, The Templars and the Ark of the Covenant. And Graham, you took us on a ride back then. It was really exciting. Now he's back with a book that is in many ways more provocative and more exciting, The Virgin Mary Conspiracy, The True Father of Christ and the Tomb of the Virgin. What a, and let me tell you folks, you are in for a ride because as you know, we don't really favor very many armchair investigators on Dreamland. We like people who go there and who do their investigations on the ground, which certainly Graham Phillips has done. And this investigation began in a most unusual way. After the publication, I believe, of his last book, Graham, you received an unexpected uh, communication, didn't you, from the Vatican? Yeah, the the book that I'd written about, which I've spoken about on your show before, was um, about the Holy Grail. Did it really exist? And uh, if so, where is it? And I basically came to the conclusion that the story of the Grail in Britain, anyway, was associated with a particular area of the country in North Wales and found a cup in that area that uh, may actually have been the, the cup that inspired the, the story of the Holy Grail. Well, that's a different story, but uh, after the book came out, uh, it attracted the attention of the, the Vatican, and I got a, uh, a letter from, uh, well, an email originally, and it followed up by a letter from a man who worked in the Vatican Library who said that he would love to meet me if I was ever I was in Rome because he wanted to talk to me about my theories concerning the Holy Grail. So um, I went to see him and, um, you know, I turned up at the Vatican and he, at first I thought it might have been some kind of hoax, you know, why would somebody from the Vatican Library be that interested in my work? But uh, I turned up and as sure as anything, this guy was uh, a priest um, who worked in the Vatican Library. He invited now, me up there. He showed me around, and he said... Now, as you... I'd I'd actually like, tell, my, tell us a little bit about the experience of actually going to the sort of the back door, as it were, of the Vatican and getting let into the places that we kind of only look at. Who You met someone rather extraordinary at that door. Yeah. He, he, um, I, I'd written in my book that the, 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 the church had covered up a lot about the Holy Grail and its early history, and all this was hidden away in the famous Vatican's secret archives. And he'd written to me saying that he'd shown me around these so-called secret archives. And um, I, he told me to meet him at the reception area as, um, as, as part of the Vatican, and uh, he came down there and, um, and met me and, and walked me up through the Vatican itself and through the Sistine Chapel where Michelangelo's famous paintings are and around the, uh, the corridors. And as we were walking down one corridor, there was this great big room, the great big doors with uh, two of the famous Swiss guard standing either side of it. And he said, uh, that's the, the Pope's private apartment. <laughs> so I walked straight past there. And he took me through some winding corridors until we eventually ended up in, in the library. And uh, that was the part of the library where academics are allowed to usually go in. So that wasn't anything that special, or it was for me, but not uh, for most people who were in doing investigations. But then he took me up some further winding staircases and all over the place until we eventually ended up in all these vaults where there were these manuscripts lying all over the place, all stacked up against the walls. And he said to me, well, this is the, the secret, ar secret archives. And he said that the only thing that's secret about them is that they're in such a mess. And there were wall after wall. Apparently, I think he said there was something like, I can't remember the exact figure now, but something like 50 miles of shelves. Uh, only about sort of 5% of these documents have ever been um, catalogued or sorted out. So he said, this is the secret archives. You're welcome to look through them if you can find what you're looking for. How extraordinary. And so you, you, were, you were just sort of led into the Vatican's secret archives, which turned out to be a big jumble, and I'm sure written in any number of different exotic languages and scripts, because they must be quite old. I mean, some of those documents must have been really ancient. 
They were. He said to me, I mean, he, the, what he, the reason he was doing this was to sort of prove to me that the, the secret archives weren't as secret as I was making out that they were, or at least I'd learned, that, I'd heard that they were. Um, but while I was there, he said, he, he said, I'm quite happy to show you some of the documents that have been sorted out over the years. And he went into one vault, and there was a, he showed me a, a document which was the signed piece of paper that excommunicated King Henry VIII of England when he broke away from the Catholic Church after having divorced one of his wives. There was uh, another piece of paper. He said this was the the uh, the, the document that um, excommunicated or kicked out of the church um, Galileo. Um, or, or, or no, that wasn't no Galileo wasn't kicked out of the church. He was threatened to be kicked out in this letter. And and there was something else that was excommunicated Martin Luther, who basically started the Protestant movement. And um, that said all these, but I couldn't read any of them. Or they were all in Latin. But it was while he was showing me through all this that he drew my attention to something which I don't think he intended to at all. Uh, I've written about the Holy Grail, and he said, have you ever thought that the Holy Grail may not only be a cup, but may be a secret reference to um, Our Lady, is what he called her. In other words, it's a Catholic name for the Virgin Mary, the mother of Jesus. And I thought, well, what? Um, no, I hadn't really thought about that. He said, well, the cup that held the blood of Christ, the womb of the Virgin Mary, which held Christ, it's the same thing in some traditions, and I'd never really heard that one before. Um, obviously, the story of the bloodline of Jesus has now been made famous by the Da Vinci Code, but this was well before that, and I hadn't heard anything about Virgin Mary being associated with it. And um, he basically showed me, uh, he, he started saying that uh, there was um, a reference he'd heard in the uh, the sort of old document that he found when he was going through the archives, trying to sort them out, from uh, 1950, when a certain Catholic uh, archaeologist who worked for the Vatican Museum had been investigating the whereabouts of the tomb of the Virgin Mary. He believed that the Grail legends were somehow symbolic references to where the tomb of the Virgin Mary was, and He'd been told to keep quiet about it, and he said, it was quite interesting, I found this document. And I suddenly thought, oh, that sounds very interesting. And when I left, I thought, I'm going to look into this. I've never heard of a, this tomb of the Virgin Mary or any association with the, the Virgin Mary and the Holy Grail. Yet he had inadvertently told me there was something hidden away in the Vatican archives that referred to this, and that's what started me on my investigation. Wow. Uh, <laughs> And tell us a little bit more about what was in this 1950 letter. Well, the background, it took me some time to, to find out the background to this, but roughly what it was, was that uh, from, from the, the, in the Bible, it doesn't actually say what happened to the Virgin Mary, Jesus' mother, after the crucifixion. No, it's she, very... Uh, it's very... to live with a unnamed... Is one one of your one of the people in the you, you mentioned in the book points out in in the Virgin Mary conspiracy points out that for this is the most important woman in the world and yet uh, she's barely mentioned in the Bible which is of course the book about her life now before we go on in, into what the letter says let's see I'd like to see if you could tell us a little bit about what has been said about Mary. Uh, there are a few sources besides the Gospels, I believe, and the Epistles. Yeah, basically, uh, the, there are some early second century documents and the Bible itself, and when you put them all together, the Virgin Mary is called the Virgin Mary because according to church tradition and the Bible, she was a virgin when she gave birth to Jesus. In other words, it, his birth was miraculous and the and the, it, 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 the, it, it implies that obviously God himself was the Virgin Mary's father. Uh, sorry, was, was, uh, was Jesus' father, and Virgin Mary gave birth to Jesus uh, because she obviously there was no earthly father for her son. Um, so this, and then after this, um, she uh, brings up Jesus. The Bible itself tells us very little about what she did during Jesus' life. She's there with him during the time of the crucifixion, after which she goes to live with an unnamed disciple, and she disappears from the Gospels. Um, it's a few, it's, it, it's 
much later, a couple of centuries after Jesus' time, that the Virgin Mary becomes very important to Christians. Eventually, the Catholic Church, as we now know it, which wasn't founded until around about 325 AD by the, the Roman Emperor Constantine the Great, he started the Church officially as the state religion of the Roman Empire. At that time, the Virgin Mary was then regarded as the most important saint. Uh, Jesus, obviously, is and God are the most important um, characters in, in the in the in the church. But beside them, the next most important character is the Virgin Mary. And many Catholics, for years, prayed to the Virgin Mary to intercede on behalf. Obviously, presumably, I mean, I'm not a Catholic, so I don't know. But it seems to me that the general idea is that. God and Jesus are a bit too busy most of the time to handle things directly, so the Virgin Mary intercedes on their behalf. But whichever way you look at it, the Virgin Mary is the most important human being that ever lived in Catholic uh, doctrine, because Jesus himself was part of God and therefore not a human being. She is the most important woman, the most important human being that ever lived. And yet nobody really knows anything about who she really was and what happened to her, where she died, and where she was buried. And and yet, now let's go back to the letter, because there's a sequence of events here. Uh, in 1950, this, tell us exactly what it, what the letter said about the Virgin. Well, it's, just to start off with, the, the, the Bible said, doesn't tell us anything about what happened. Listen, to Graham, Mary. wait, before we go um, on, I am embarrassed to say that we've come up on a break, and I'm, Usually very careful with my breaks, but I didn't notice this one coming in. And so we're going to find this out after the break. And, folks, it, you can get uh, Graham's book, The Virgin Mary Conspiracy, from the unknowncountry.com bookstore. And you should shop there because it helps the site keep going. And also you get great discount prices from us. And if you're a subscriber, you get an additional 10% off shopping with the unknowncountry.com store. And it's a personal experience. It's not shopping like with one of the big websites. If something goes wrong, you're dealt with by Al Harlow, who works for our store and knows many of you personally after all of the years you've been customers. A whole different experience, a much more intimate, much more personal experience at the unknowncountry.com store. Graham Phillips' website is grahamphillips.net. Don't miss it. Grahamphillips.net. Keep up with what he's doing because he's one of the people who's seriously untangling the knots of the past. We can't really know who we are unless we understand where we truly came from. A lot of effort has been made to conceal that at every level. This is Whitley Strieber at Streamland. We'll be right back. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We're talking to Graham Phillips, the Virgin Mary Conspiracy, the true father of Christ and the tomb of the Virgin. Who was Christ? Who was the Virgin? Well, we'll get to the fascinating information that he's discovered about Christ. And for our subscribers, we're going to be talking about the lost years of Jesus as well in the subscriber section, a remarkable segment of the Virgin Mary conspiracy that goes deeper into those mysterious years in Egypt, I think, than anyone ever has before. He's got some really, really new discoveries. But now let's get back to 1950, to this remarkable letter and what transpired immediately after. What we were just asking before the break, what, Graham, exactly did the letter say about the Virgin? Well, it basically said that this man... Uh, this Vatican archaeologist in the 19, in 1950, um, he, um, he had, the, the church asked him to, to, to seek out, to find if there was a tomb of the Virgin Mary. Now the reason they'd done this, uh, was because, in the Bible it doesn't tell us what happened to her, but within a few, few hundred years of Jesus' death, the story had circulated that, um, the Virgin Mary was um, her, was r rose to heaven uh, bodily, like Jesus had ascended to heaven. So shortly after, when she died, her body was taken up bodily into heaven. That was the tradition that arose. But some people believed that the Virgin Mary didn't have a tomb on earth because she had um, ascended bodily into heaven. Other people at the same time began to believe two different stories. One, that she was buried in the Roman city of Ephesus, or in or it was half 
Greek half Roman city of Ephesus in what's now Turkey. And another story was that she was buried in Jerusalem in the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Now, both of these places had um, shrines where pilgrims would go for many hundreds of years to worship at what was supposed to be the tomb of the Virgin Mary. In Jerusalem, which was the, the main site, pilgrims spent a fortune going there and gave great donations to the church over many centuries to have a look at this tomb that was supposed to be the Virgin Mary's, to examine and to look and touch, to look at and touch bones that were supposed to be Mary's bones. And the church made a lot of money out of this. Now, so the church was divided. Some people thought she was buried in Jerusalem and, um, and others in Ephesus. And then there was this other lot of people who thought, no, she wasn't buried anywhere on earth. She'd ridden, bo- ridden, ridden bodily into heaven. So basically, the church itself didn't have a dogma on this. It didn't have a doctrine to say you've got to believe one thing or the other and left it open to the individual churchgoer to make up their mind. Until 1950, when the Pope at the time suddenly decided he, uh, he, that the Virgin Mary had risen bodily to heaven. She was far too important for her to be buried anywhere, so she'd risen to heaven. And every churchgoer, every Catholic, every Christian, according to his uh, uh, dogma, was supposed to now believe that the Virgin Mary ascended bodily to heaven. If you didn't believe that, you were a heretic. Now, this left the church in a rather embarrassing position because they had this church, this uh, shrine in Jerusalem, that they were charging money for people to go and have a look at the Virgin Mary's bones. What did they do about this? So it was left up to the cardinal in the Vatican to sort this all out. So somebody came up with a bright idea of getting this archaeologist who was uh, attached to the Vatican Museum to go to Jerusalem, have a look at this tomb, and decide whether it was real or whether it wasn't, and then to go and have a look at the one in Ephesus in Turkey and basically come up with you know whatever its conclusions were. Well, they knew as a as a, a pretty straightforward archaeologist that he, he was very likely to turn around and say, "No, these tombs are fake. They're nothing to do with the Virgin Mary." So. He could then announce that before it was made official that the Pope had said the Virgin Mary ascended to heaven. That would clear up the mess for them. And this archaeologist went along to uh, the, to Jerusalem and did. He said, "No, no, there's no evidence that this is genuine." He did the same in Ephesus in Turkey, and so they were very happy about it. However, he then said, "Unfortunately, though, I found evidence, historical evidence." that there was a third tomb of the Virgin Mary, which I believe was probably her real tomb. And oh, at dear. this point, not, this not, not wanted for the Vatican. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, th- th- yeah that, I, I'm sorry, we're, we're, folks, we're talking between England and uh, California at the moment, where I happen to be. And uh, Graham, because of the trunk lines being busy, is on a cell phone, so we're jumping on each other a little bit as we converse. Please uh, forgive the <laughs> slight difficulties we're having. Anyway, Graham, I, what I was going to say is that, that 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 must have been rather bad news for them, that now they've got an even worse tomb. Uh, they Here they are, uh, uh, ascending her into heaven physically, in, in complete, I guess, with everything in her pockets, uh, and up she goes, where I've often wondered. But in any case, here they, they're planning to do that, and yet there's another tomb. Tell us a little bit more about this tomb. First, have you been to it? Have you seen it? The, the tomb, the, the, well, the thing was that this archaeologist, when he was, he was going to publish something about where this tomb was, that the, the Vatican, um, there was an organization at the Vatican, which is called the Holy Office now, um, it, that is the, the same organization that used to call the Inquisition. Cardinal Ratzinger was the head of the before he became Pope. It used to be called the Inquisition, folks. Go ahead. And, yeah, and, and the Inquisition, of, you know, this is what used to burn people at the stake, torture people, for, and, and make sure that they toe the, the line of the church. Okay, they don't have that same kind of power anymore, but they're now called the Holy Office, and it's their job to decide who in the Catholic Church gets excommunicated um, in other words, no longer part of the Catholic Church and, and their belief will go to hell if, if they don't toe the line. And uh, they hauled this guy in before them and said, well, you, you've got to keep quiet about this or we're going to excommunicate you. And so being a good Catholic, he kept quiet about it for the rest of his life. 
And so what I decided to do was to try and find out where this guy had found this third tomb of the Virgin Mary. Where was the tomb of the Virgin Mary that this guy thought was real? And so began quite an extraordinary journey. Graham, what did you do next? Well, the the first thing was that, um, that I, I, you know, I, I tried to work out logically where the Virgin Mary might have gone to. Um, the earliest re- references I could find anywhere um, were in a third century document, which uh, still remains in Valencia, Cathedral. And this document basically refers to the Virgin Mary and a number of disciples from the uh, Jesus' original disciples traveling, escaping Palestine, and coming to the Isle of Britain. Now, at first, this sounded a bit stupid because I thought, well, surely the why would they just Britain? You know, Britain, the coast of Britain is two thousand miles from Jerusalem. It's just nuts. However, when I looked into it, I found out that at the time Jesus died, the Roman Empire was um, was obviously ruled by the Romans throughout the whole of Europe and most of the Middle East. But at that time, Britain hadn't been conquered. And a number of dissidents who were being persecuted by the Roman Church, including the Christians, by the, sorry, by the Roman Empire, including the Christian Church, a lot of these people did historically flee to Britain. And it didn't take, it could easily be got to those Roman roads all over Europe and as a regular boat service uh, for trading purposes that came across the English Channel from France to, to England. So it was quite possible that the Virgin Mary and the disciples came here to flee persecution. And then I found uh, other references in Britain, written by early Christians in the century, referring to the fact that they believed that the Virgin Mary uh, had come to this country. And finally, I I, I found that um, that another pope, a pope in around about 600, a man called Gregory the Great, he had heard about these stories of the Virgin Mary coming to Britain, and he wanted uh, his emissary in this country to disprove it. He didn't like that idea one a bit. He thought she was buried in Jerusalem. So he sent uh, him to England, and while he was over here, this man, St. Augustine, as he's now known, Augustine at the time, who became the first Archbishop of Canterbury in England, he wrote back to the Pope and said, well, Cutting a very long story short, this is that he wrote back to the Pope and, 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 and described this church on an island somewhere off the west of Britain where it seems the Virgin Mary's remains were still being kept and people still believed that these were um, belonged to Jesus' mother. And so this was in the words of a guy the Pope had sent to England to disprove that, the story in 600. He'd, he'd written back and said, well, she's here. Um, so this, I believe, was what this archaeologist in 1950 discovered that there was this tomb somewhere in an island off the west of Britain where the Virgin Mary's remains were being kept. And and do you think that there's validity to this, that uh, that they are there or were there? Well, the, the, thing, the, the thing was, it's interesting that um, the, the, the church that he seems to be referring to, the only church... I, well, it, it originally, but going back to the Middle Ages and before the Dark Ages, going back 1500 years or so, churches, when they were founded, were called St. Somebody's Church, St. Mark's Church, St. Mary's, St. Joseph, or whatever it happens to be, church. Now, churches are called by the names of saints just because they happen to sound nice. But in those days, they were only called after saints when the, when, when, when the tomb or the bones of that particular saint were interred there. In other words, the church was named Saint Somebody's Church because that saint's bones or tomb was in that church. And there is one early Saint Mary the Virgin's Church in the middle of an island off the coast of Wales in, in, in Western Britain, an island called Anglesey. And that church is in a, in a little town called Lanark Med. So I went there to have a look at this um, this church and it's pretty much dilapidated now, but it's uh, the, 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 old, the foundations of it can be dated back uh, almost 2,000 years, so it is very, very old. It's one of the earliest churches. In fact, it's the earliest church in Britain. And we're going um, to find out, and, Graham, we're going to have to stop now for a brief break. 
We're going to find out more about this church in just a moment. What happened when he went to this ancient place? What did he find? Well, we'll be back with more Dreamland in just a moment. Later, Linda Moulton Howe has got a big surprise for you, I can assure you. So keep listening. This is Whitley Strieber. This is Dreamland. We'll be right back. This is Whitley Strieber. This is Dreamland. We're talking to Graham Phillips, the Virgin Mary Conspiracy, available at a great discount from the unknowncountry.com store, plus an additional 10% off our discount price if you're an unknowncountry.com subscriber. Subscribe today. Help keep it all rolling. The reason this program is so free and easy and can do anything it pleases is because of you, you who pay for the website and keep it going. That is why we're free. We do not take advertising for a reason. It comes with conditions, and we don't happen to care to meet those conditions. We want to be completely and totally free. Graham's website, grahamphillips.net, don't miss it. Take a look. Learn to untangle your own past and find out who you really are. We can't do that unless we untangle history. Okay, Graham, let's go back to that little church in Anglesey. Yeah, well, when I um, uh, I went there, I discovered that uh, um, in the Middle Ages, uh, the church was being, well, around about 1000 AD, the church was um, under attack by the Vikings who were raiding the coast of Britain, coming down from uh, Scandinavia. And during one of these raids, a number of important uh, possessions, relics that the church had, were hidden in the area. Um, one of these relics was a, uh, a, a chest containing the bones that seemingly were that of the Virgin Mary, according to that ch- tradition. The question then was, where did these bones end up? And I managed to trace them to another church nearby, and then found that in the 1900s, I believe it was, these bones were, 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 were moved um, yet again, and finally, I found where they had been buried beside an old holy well, just outside this village of Lanark Med in the middle of the island of Anglesey, and marked with a simple stone. And the reason I managed to locate where they were is because the stone, which was in a uh, overgrown hedge, had the sign for the celestial, for the celestial constellation of Virgo written on it. The letter, a strange sort of letter V and an M sort of together, which is the old astrological sign for Virgo, the Virgin. And it seems that this was the clue that was led to where the, the, the bones were actually buried. So there, it seems, were the, were the clues of the Virgin Mary, if, uh, if my trail of clues was right. Remarkable. So... It, it, now, what does this mean in terms of, it seems as if the Vatican simply suppressed this information as recently as just uh, the, the early 50s. And what does that tell us? Does it tell us that they believe that this is false or, or something else? Uh, why did they decide on the physical assumption? What basis did they have for this? Well, there seems to be two reasons. Firstly, they didn't want anybody, uh, and certainly like one of their own archaeologists, saying he believed that the Virgin Mary was buried anywhere when Christian doctrine, when church doctrine now said she ascended bodily into heaven. But the other thing is, I think they probably didn't want anybody examining these bones. Um, certainly they wouldn't want that today, because if you can get out of bones, you can examine them for DNA, find out exactly where somebody came from and who they probably were. Um, you get bones of of a particular family, and they're buried in certain places, and you can dig those up, analyze them, and then check them against other bones to find out who's related to who. And it might actually tell you, I mean, this is not this is not in the 50s, but certainly now the church wouldn't want um, these bones, if they could be proved to be Mary's, um, analyzed, because, you, because maybe there's something they have to hide about who she really was and who she was related to. Now, the thing is, what started to make me think that there was something to, to hide is when I published the book, and, and that was really before all the research was completed, but when I originally published the book in England, I mean, the book that's out now, The Virgin American Conspiracy, 
American version of the original book that the the Marion Conspiracy, as it was called, um, with, with the latest one got all the latest stuff in it. But originally, when I published the book and it came out in Italy, the um, I got excommunicated. Now, the weird thing was, I'm not even communicated. I'm not a Catholic. They didn't know that. And so they immediately excommunicated me without checking me out at all. So in other words, it is heresy for a Catholic to read my book. How did you find out you were excommunicated? It was in that, well, I just, in, in England, you have this thing that every year when it's the Queen's birthday, when they announce the New Year's Honours list, that's when people become lords and serve somebody else. They, they get knighted. People in America might be aware of that. <laughs> They're probably not aware that a similar thing happens every so often in, in the Catholic Church where newspapers announce who has been excommunicated in Italy. Um, how I was excommunicated was that uh, uh, a newspaper was going to print something about my, my ideas in Italy, a major newspaper, and they, the, the church told them that um, not to print it, and they said, well, well, we can print this guy's books. He's, uh, he's not on your, your blacklist. And so that's how they had to quickly put me on their blacklist so that this newspaper, being good Catholic, people wouldn't publish it. And they had to quickly put me on their blacklist. And the only way they could do that is announce my excommunication. Um, but they did it without checking out to find out that I wasn't a Catholic in the first place. And so, so I suppose that means I could never join if I wanted to. But the, the serious side of this is that they obviously were, did, they didn't want this story going around. Why didn't they just ignore it? Right, be, it seems terribly important to them, Graham. They seem to have panicked. I well, mean, it obviously was. Now, the, the, yeah, they seem to have panicked. Oh, and, go ahead. Yeah, they seem to have panicked. And uh, th it's interesting that this must be much more important to them than the. on the surface it would seem like something they could just ignore, obviously, as you said. But you also said... Um, you, 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 as you were talking a moment ago, you, you talked about who she was really related to and who she actually was. And let's get into that a little bit. What does your research suggest? Yeah. She, who, who was this woman that we call Mary now? Well, the reason, I, I forgot at the beginning, really, to mention why I was looking for Mary's tomb in the first place. I mean, this Vatican archaeologist put me, uh, this Vatican um, librarian put me onto the, the, the whole thing. But um, the, 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 the reason I was interested to find the Virgin Mary is because I came up with a theory as to who she actually was. And the only way I could prove this was to find her bones. Um, or the only way it could be proved scientifically would be to find her bones. Now... This, according to the Bible, Mary was a home woman who uh, was a carpenter's wife um, um, from Nazareth in, in Palestine, uh, north of Jerusalem. And she, as a person of no real importance, except it does mention that her father, um, or, or and in some stories, that some early versions of the story, her adopted father um, was the high priest of the Jerusalem temple. Um, but apart from that, she just appears to be a rather um, humble woman, with, uh, just a humble Jewish woman from Palestine. Now, the thing is that how I kind of got onto wondering who she might have been was that the, the, story, the story about Jesus, when he, is, um, when he goes on trial before Pontius mm -hmm. Pilate, um, the reason why he's executed is because uh, the... Jewish priesthood um, really didn't want him going around causing trouble. They sent him to Pontius Pilate, who was the Roman governor of Palestine, of Judea, around the area around Jerusalem. And um, first of all, they said, this guy claims to be king of the Jews, so maybe I'll execute him. And first of all, Pilate turned around and said, well, I, I can't find any in him. In other words, he didn't find that, find that there was any fault in Jesus' claim that he was king of the Jews. Um, it was later, the, he, he washed his hands of the whole matter, quite literally, and said, well, it's up to, you know, up, you know, everybody else can decide what to do with him. And so he was executed for heresy by his own people, really. But um, I thought, hold on a minute, if Jesus was executed, if he claimed to be king of the Jews and Pilate thought there was, that he was, what on earth is going on here? 
Now, the thing was that I began to look into the recorded history of the time that Jesus was alive to find out who really was the king of the Jews, the officially recognized king of the Jews. Now, at the time when Jesus was born, it was a man called Herod. He ruled all of Palestine, what is now Jerusalem and the West Bank, uh, Jerusalem, West Bank, Israel, the Gaza Strip. He ruled that whole area on behalf of the Roman Empire, a man called Herod the Great. Now, when Herod died, shortly about the time that Jesus was born, the country was divided up between his four sons. But the Roman Emperor Augustus had decreed originally that a son of his called Antipater and um, this guy Antipater's wife, Mariamne, that their Mariamne's and Antipater's son should become king of the Jews if he grew to manhood. It was some complicated thing that the Roman Emperor Augustus decided on. Now, the thing was that Herod didn't like this idea at all, and he had Antipater, his own son, killed, ordered the death of Mariamne, but she fled from the royal palace in Jerusalem and disappeared from the pages of history. And Herod went round um, getting his soldiers to find this baby that had been born to Mariamne, um, his daughter-in-law, to have it killed so that it could never become the king of Palestine. And obviously, the, the, the idea is that this, 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 it seems, because he's never heard from again, that this baby was killed. Um, the Roman emperor, when he found out that Herod was dead, sorted the whole thing out by saying, OK, we'll divide it up between Herod's four surviving sons. And that's how it carried on until the Romans themselves decided to install a Roman governor, and that was Pontius Pilate. Now, I started to think, hold on a minute. At the time, just before Herod dies, he's sending all these um, troops looking for this baby, the son of somebody called Mariamne, because he fears he's the king of the Jews. This sounds just like the Bible and the birth of Jesus, because the Bible says that when Jesus was born in a stable near Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Herod sent the troops to kill the baby because he learned from the three wise men that Jesus was going to be king of the Jews. Now I thought, hold on, there's got to be some connection with this. I also then suddenly thought, no, 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 this, this has got to mean something, when I realized that Mariamne was the Roman version of the name Mary. So you've got this baby being born at exactly the same time as Jesus, being hunted by Herod's troops at exactly the same time as Jesus, who is the son of somebody called Mary. In other words, I must have found historical evidence outside the Bible for the birth of Jesus and who Mary, his mother, really was. And that was Mariamne, the, the uh, daughter-in-law of Herod the Great, the man who tried to kill Jesus. How remarkable and unexpected. Now, in the politics of the situation, why would, he, why would Jesus have come in? Why would they have wanted to kill Jesus? Well, the reason why is quite simply the reason why they wanted to kill, by like historically, and this is recorded by a first century Jewish historian who wrote uh, shortly after the death of Jesus, a man called Josephus, whose book still survives. Um, he talked about this, this unmitting son of Mariam, Mary, um, as the, the reason why Herod wanted him dead is quite simply because the Roman emperor, in some kind of, when he got drunk, that was uh, the Roman emperor Augustus, had suddenly decided to complicate things for the for the Jews by naming this baby as this, the daughter of Mariam, the son of Mariamne, as being the next king of the Jews. He just wanted to complicate the matter. He, it really was a political thing, so he could send in his own troops and take it to the place when they all started fighting amongst each other. It was a political move, really. But the fact was that this boy, this unnamed boy, was thought to have died. Shortly after that, the Emperor Augustus died. The new emperor Tiberius and the Senate in Rome then announced that Augustus was a god. He became a god after his death. So Augustus the god, any decree that had been made by Augustus before he died was then on the statute books and couldn't be repealed because Augustus was a god. So if anybody in the future ever ended up claiming to be the son of Mariamne, Mary, um, the the, 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 uh, the the Lord of Herod, if anyone could prove they were that uh, son, then they would become king of the Jews, and there was nothing that the Roman emperor or the Senate or anybody else could do about it without undermining their entire constitution, because the, because the god 
had decreed that this boy should be the, the king. That is why they wanted him dead. Wow. Fascinating. We're going to take a little break. We'll be right back with Graham Phillips. We're back talking to Graham Phillips about what is, to say the least, an alternate view of early Christian history and one that has a curious kind of resonance. His book, The Virgin Mary Conspiracy, is available from the unknowncountry.com bookstore at a great discount and plus 10% off, more off, if you are a subscriber. And you can expect very pleasant, very personal service from the unknowncountry.com bookstore. Unfortunately, we cannot afford telephone orders. Uh, we do everything on the internet and by email. That's how we keep going. Uh, you can order by mail. If you look on unknowncountry.com and click on the store tab and scroll down, if you want to order my mail, instructions are there. The Virgin Mary Conspiracy. Graham Phillips' website, grahamphillips.net. Keep up with his latest findings. And he has a really, Graham, I have to tell you, you're one of the most fascinating researchers I have heard. We're open to just about everything on this radio program in terms of research. And that gets me to the question of the idea that that Mary Magdalene went from uh, from the Middle East to southern france and are you saying therefore now that jesus's mother went to britain his people believe his wife went to france and indeed the most extraordinary thing about the french legend is that the cathar religion which was a a, a very primitive pr sort of proto christianity was invested deeply in the very part of France she was supposed, Mary Magdalene was supposed to have gone to. Uh, so you think that there was a sort of dispersal of these people after Jesus died. But now, if he was just a royal son, the son of, a, of Herod, that sort of flies in the face of the fact that he was, the people who lived on after him, we're saying things about him that we have never forgotten that have become the center of Western civilization in a way and of Western belief that he was much more than that, that he was t touched by a miracle and more than touched by a miracle was a living miracle. C can you comment on how this, how you react to all of this based on what you've discovered? Well, the first thing is that the people who said he was a living miracle um, didn't really say this until quite some time after his death. At the time he died, he was considered to be a preacher um, more than a, a living miracle. But just just to go back a second to what to what I was saying, it, it starts to make sense as to why Jesus was considered so important and who he really was. And that is, in, in the Da Vinci Code, there's this whole uh, theory outlined that... Uh, Jesus married Mary Magdalene, and they had children, and they had descendants, and some of those might be alive today, and who are they, and do they really live in Rotherham Chapel in Scotland? Now, the thing is that um, the, the theory behind that, I know a couple of people who did some of the original research onto that years ago that Dan Brown um, used, and yes, it does seem that there is this bloodline, but I haven't researched it fully myself, so it, it might all be wrong, but obviously it was thought to be important, and there certainly is good evidence to suggest that Jesus mm. probably did have some sort of relationship more than just uh, platonic with Mary Magdalene. Now, the thing was that the question is that if Jesus' bloodline is important, who really was Jesus? Now, according to the Bible, he is the Son of God. Um, he didn't have an earthly father. Mary was a virgin. Now, the first problem is that the, 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 refer, the, the, the reference to Mary being a virgin is a mistranslation of the original Bible, where the word used is... Alma, which actually simply means maiden. It doesn't mean somebody who is who is a virgin. It means somebody who is a young woman. The word virgin in Hebrew is betula. That word wasn't used. Somebody, when they translated the Bible into Greek and Latin and modern languages, simply confused the story that, that she was a young woman uh, and not a, 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 not necessarily a virgin. 
Now, if she isn't a virgin, because the church would argue against that, no, 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 that's not what it meant, and they will argue it forever. But if one can prove, for example, that Mary is this Mariamne, and there's a good case for that, then they, are, they have really got problems. But there's no absolute proof that Mary is Mariamne, unless you've got her bones. Now, if you've got a bone, and you can DNA test them, and then have uh, the Herod's bones and the other members of uh, the, the, the royal family of Judea at the time still survive, uh, including this Mariamne's sister. Her bones have survived in Jerusalem. Uh, they are on display in a museum, in the Rockefeller Museum, I believe. Now, if those bones, DNA tested, can show that this woman that's buried in Wales is in fact the sister of the woman who was Mariamne's sister, that goes a hell of a long way towards showing that Mary, who Mary really was, and if Mary really was Mariamne, then her husband, the father of the child, was Herod's son, Antipater. In other words, he didn't, God wasn't his father, God was a prince of Judea. Now that is what would really upset the church, and that is why they had to, well, I believe that's why they had to excommunicate me. Now the thing is, why would Jesus be considered to be so important. Okay, we know his bloodline's important thereafter, but the bloodline that led to him, what is so important about that? If it wasn't God Almighty who was his father, who was it? Well, Antipater and Herod were, in fact, although they were, Jew they were Jews and they ruled Palestine, this is the thing that makes it even more controversial. I'll probably get excommunicated from the, from the Jewish world now, but the fact of the matter is that these people who ruled uh, Palestine at the time uh, uh, that uh, Jesus was born were not native Judeans or descendants of the ancient Israelites. They were Greeks that the Romans had put there to rule on their behalf who had converted to Judaism. Herod, Antipater, and this son, if it is Jesus, were Greeks. And their ancestor was the most important man in the Greek, that the Greek world ever had, Alexander the Great. That, I believe, is the real bloodline that's being preserved the bloodline of Alexander the Great. Good heavens. Uh, well, you know, on this program, we our objective is always the same, which is to enable the authors to fully expose their ideas. And I would like to know this. Do you, you, this is basically, it's original research, and it's really quite good research, but it also doesn't, there isn't, doesn't seem to be much anywhere, even in sort of alternative, the world of alternative research into Christian origins, that that supports it. And if you could give us your main, the main thing that that supports this story, as far as you're concerned. Well, the main thing that supports the story is there's very there's very little of. Jewish history survives outside the Bible because in the first century AD, the Romans vast, uh, persecuted the Jews terribly. They killed millions of them because they revolted against Rome twice, once in the 600s and another time in the early 2nd, sorry, once in sorry, not, the 60s AD, not 600s, in the 60s AD, they revolted against Rome. Again, they did so in the early 2nd century. And uh, what happened is that the Romans completely uh, wiped out, uh, they killed millions of Jews, they, they burnt hundreds of towns, um, and they destroyed nearly all of their records. Some of them, like the Dead Sea Scrolls, were hidden, their religious texts that were hidden and discovered many years later. But most of their history was wiped out. One of the only surviving histories written by the Jewish people in the first century is this book by a man called Josephus, it, it's, and, it's, and it's accepted as being a genuine history of the Jewish people um, by nearly all academic scholars. And it is in Josephus' work that we learn about Mariamne and Herod's persecutions of, uh, when he tries to kill her baby, and that is history. And then when we compare that with what the Bible says, we find that it's happening at exactly the, the same time. I mean, I just can't see that there's two, two Marys being sought by Herod at the same time because he believes that both of them have uh, given birth to the king of the Jews. Um, it, it, it must be referring to the same event, and I would say that is the strongest backbone of my theory. The proof of it would obviously be if one could have the 
Virgin Mary's bones analysed. Now the problem is that this this tomb in um, this tomb in, 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 in on the Isle of Anglesey in Britain, it's uh, where the bones are. The, the the ground there is very acidic, and the bones have virtually turned to mush in the ground. It is only now, however, that the that there is scientific evidence. Uh, sorry, scientific uh, advances are in, uh, have taken uh, enough of a stride for um, geophysicists to examine the soil itself and reconstruct the DNA from the from the bones that uh, are in a very very fragile state. So I'm hoping that that will happen, but it hasn't happened yet. Well, you know, uh, Graham, I hope it does happen too, because it, it it would certainly tell us two things. One, if she was a woman, if the bones were the bone, bones of a woman, and probably also if she was Semitic from the Middle East, or Greek for that matter. And if either was the case, it would make a, it would be extremely powerful. Now